Tonight, government says it will stop a controversial practice of incarcerating migrants in its provincial prison. Documents allege a Congolese man was held inside HMP for more than a year and say he faced shocking and racist treatment. Healthcare is still top of mind. Cost of living is still top of mind. There's a need for healthy investment in infrastructure. So you'll see all, us touch on all those things tomorrow. Well, just a day away from budget 2024, public sector unions want the province to scrap its plan for private highways. Frustrated travelers often turn to social media to get a flight problem fixed, but are you sure you're talking directly with the airline? I was very concerned. And I thought, how would they be able to get that information just from my booking reference? I'm Peter Cowan. I'll tell you why scammers are targeting travelers coming up on Here and Now. This is CBC Here and Now. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. CBC News has learned a man was kept at Her Majesty's Penitentiary for about a year and a half after serving his criminal sentence. The Congolese citizen was kept in prison due to his immigration status. And while there, he said to have been, quote, treated like an animal. Now, earlier this month, we reported how Newfoundland and Labrador was the only province in the country that still intended to hold immigrants in provincial prisons, though government has since changed its mind. Reporter Patrick Butler has been following this story. So, Patrick, let's start with the man held at HMP. What more can you tell us about what he endured? So his name is Dudu Kikewa, and, and he was convicted of identity theft, fraud, and breaches of court orders in August 2019. Um, he'd stolen the, the personal data of about 20 people to create fake IDs and obtain credit cards. And by the time his sentence was handed down, he had about a year left to serve at Her Majesty's Penitentiary. Um, but while incarcerated, um, Dudu Kikewa was also declared inadmissible uh, by uh, immigration officials. And, and that means that he served what immigration lawyers call double punishment. That meant that he stayed about 19 months longer than expected in detention, while the Canada Border Services Agency uh, arranged for his removal from Canada. Um, at HMP, which is a prison, uh, we've, we've talked lots about this, right, where uh, conditions have been called outrageous, have been called deplorable. Um, he was placed in solitary confinement. He was placed on suicide watch. Documents from the Immigration and Refugee Board um, tell us he was allegedly, allegedly cuffed, subjected to threats and racist comments. Uh, he was also deprived of water and, and had to drink from the toilet bowl. Um, there were also no services for him in French, no family or community supports. Um, Kikewa had no money to purchase hygiene products, for example, and his mental state uh, declined significantly as a result. Okay, so Patrick, if immigration officials decided Kikiwa should be deported, why did he remain at HMP for so long? So this is where you see the deficiencies in our country's immigration system, right? There's, there's no detention center in the province for people being detained solely based on uh, immigration status. Um, federal officials decided Kikewa was, was a danger to the public um, at a flight risk, and they decided that there was no other choice but to keep him at HMP. Um, Kikewa's deportation was also delayed a number of times. He refused to take a COVID-19 test, which was uh, required by Congolese authorities. Um, and there was also a procedural review of his file at federal court. So another delay because of that. Um, now, Kikewa did request a transfer to a federal detention facility in Quebec, where the guards, of course, speak French, where he also had uh, his family in that, in that province. Um, and he eventually did arrive there, but only after two attempts, um, both of which were allegedly quite violent. Um, on the second transfer, he was allegedly restrained, made to wear a mask, um, and was given a sedative without his authorization. Okay. Was Kikewa ever actually deported in the end? So we weren't able to actually confirm that. Um, what I can tell you is that Kikewa's story raises serious questions about the detention of immigrants in Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, Justice Minister John Holgan uh, said uh, earlier this month um, that immigration detention numbers are, are lower than low in this province. Um, but Border Services, Canada Border Services, uh, says that in the last five years, at least 28 people have been detained um, in this province on uh, immigration grounds. And it says detaining immigrants should only be used as a last resort, um, the Provincial Justice uh, Department says any action taken during Kikewa's detention uh, was the result of risks that he presented to himself, staff, and other inmates. 
Um, and Carolyn, you mentioned off the top that the government um, has, has changed its mind on immigration detention. Um, uh, holding immigrants in prison purely on immigration grounds will no longer be possible in this province starting at the end of March uh, 2025. Thank you so much, Patrick. That's our Patrick Butler reporting from the newsroom. Well, some pre-budget announcements from the province today, along with competing demands for attention from two of the province's largest unions. Here and now's Heather Gillis has more. It started with NAEP during this morning's rush hour, when the union gathered to protest possible government plans to privatize the building and maintenance of highways. President Jerry Earle says that will mean lower quality services and higher costs. We certainly hope we don't see indications in the provincial budget that to continue to contemplate this process, uh, because our commitment is uh, that we will continue to escalate these actions. That Later, Transportation Minister John Abbott announced a $250 million budget for roads this fiscal year. He says privatization is just a possibility. We are still doing our homework as to what options we want to pursue, one of which is was uh, a P3, uh, and, uh, but we had made, uh, as a government, had made no decisions yet on that. Abbott says they're already issuing tenders for some of this year's road work, committing to a new interchange at Galway, culvert replacements and fixing lights on the Outer Ring Road. This afternoon, the Premier also entered the pre-budget announcement blitz. He announced a $13.5 million new sports complex, one that's going to have a walking track and a turf field. It'll also have room to rehab patients. NL Health Services will run rehab weekdays, fulfilling health accord promises, with the announcement pleasing the sports community, adding turf capacity for rugby, soccer and more. It fulfills an acute rehabilitation need uh, for patients who have orthopedic conditions, who have lung and heart uh, issues, have cancer issues that need actual physical space to, to rehabilitate. So it fulfills that, but it also creates a provincial, uh, enhances a provincial training institution that we see here at the Newfoundland and Labrador Sports Centre. But the competition for the public's attention isn't over. With budget day tomorrow, some fish harvesters have planned protests outside the Confederation building. Government this afternoon tried to cool them down by releasing an expression of interest to allow snow crab export to buyers outside the province. And we'll continue to try our best to work with them. But we've already said outside buyers, yes. Increased capacity, yes. Full review of foreign ownership and corporate concentration, yes. So please come to the table and continue to work with us on it. The finance minister will deliver the budget publicly tomorrow afternoon. One, the premier says, will focus on health care, the cost of living and infrastructure. Heather Gillis, CBC News, St. John's. Well, as Heather mentioned there, that release about the fishery comes after weeks of protests by fish harvesters and their union. The fisheries minister says he's ready to meet at least one of their demands. The department is asking fish buyers and processors to submit an expression of interest for a temporary license to export live snow crab out of this province for this year's fishery. In a news release today, it says this would allow government to gauge interest from outside buyers. The FFA and fish harvesters have been calling on the province to open the fishery. For weeks, there have been protests, and the Premier says he's committed to making changes. Look, we're listening to harvesters. We're working with harvesters. We've been working with the FFAW. We've responded to the FFAW's requests, and we'll continue to work with them. We've committed to looking at the deeper structural issues. We've asked them to come to the table to help us with the terms of reference with respect to foreign, constant, foreign uh, investment and corporate concentration within the industry. That will take some time, but we would like to sit with them and, and uh, determine the right form and the right instrument and the terms of reference for that. We've agreed to outside buyers and we've agreed to look at further increasing capacity. We've already said we're going to increase capacity, but we just need to know exactly what, uh, what amount we're looking at. But the Nova Scotia Seafood Alliance says this move from the Newfoundland and Labrador government may not make economic sense. The group represents processors and buyers in Nova Scotia and says the government here was late in making the change. 
plants already have their plans in place for what they're going to be doing for really the vast majority of the season. As you know, you begin at snow crab and then you shift on to other species as the season goes on. Well, the, having a, a large uh, amount of raw material available on the front end of the season might not fit into a production schedule. So if there is an intent to actually pursue this in the future, uh, then there really has to be a little bit more notice than on the eve of a fishery opening and the eve of the, the, these operations beginning. Well, the Premier is also defending government's latest deal with the financially troubled Cornerbrook Pulp and Paper Mill. The province quietly brokered the $22 million deal in January and announced it last week. It spans February to July of this year and will see Newfoundland and Labrador Hydro pay eight times more for electricity from Kruger's Deer Lake Dam. And El Hydro already has a deal with Kruger to use power during peak times and spent less than $3 million for that power during the winter period. Kruger already owes the province more than $117 million for a, a 2014 loan to save the mill. Opposition MHAs are questioning how and why the deal happened. The previous deal was a power purchase agreement, obviously for you know, stability, energy stability for the west coast of Newfoundland. And now we're going to be paying like I said, eight times more. So clearly there is something here that is more than just a power purchase agreement. It's obviously some sort of, uh, you know, deal for, uh, for Kruger to, you know, find a way to get money into the company. This is about protecting jobs in Newfoundland and Labrador and making sure that we invest in Newfoundland and Labrador, invest in the people in Newfoundland and Labrador. And that's what we should be talking about. But that again comes down to what's the strategy? Where's the plan? And, uh, you know, that's what I want to see. I want to see some assurances that people that work in the mill in, in Cornerbrook and depend on, the, on it for other jobs that are created have assurances that their government has a plan, that there is a strategic way forward. And that's what we should be focused on. Well, speaking with reporters today, Premier Fury says he believes the $22 million deal with Kruger is good value for the money. Well, they've said that they're going to diversify and we'll hold them to that uh, with respect to the diversification plans. Um, this isn't a forever agreement. Uh, this is a uh, please help us understand how you're going to diversify, not, uh, not just for the economy, but for the people in, Cor in Cornerbrook, but uh, also for everybody who works in the forestry industry. Temperatures today a little warmer than they were yesterday for uh, pretty much a good chunk of the province, anywhere from zero or two to four degrees uh, better than where we were sitting yesterday, about one degree warmer in Happy Valley Goose Bay today, and there's really not a whole lot of weather happening. Uh, we do have an area of low pressure, but uh, just seeing some showers or flurries pretty much uh, across the island and up across parts of Labrador. But again, nothing super significant at the moment. We see that a uh, little disturbance moving just to the east of the Avalon at the moment. And we do have some flurries as well, working their way towards the western portion of the island. If we take a live look outside, what's happening? The wind relatively light out there, but uh, we have temperature around two degrees, some showers happening at the moment and uh, really not feeling a whole lot like spring, but it will officially arrive tonight uh, just after midnight Newfoundland time. Uh, and basically this is the vernal equinox. That means we're going to see equal day and night. And uh, yeah, that officially arrives tonight. So we'll talk about what the official spring weather will be like for tomorrow. A national mental health portal is shutting down soon and advocates across the country worry about the gaps it leaves behind. How can we possibly lose such an accessible service? I'm Henrike Wilhelm. I'll have that story on Here and Now. Well, social media can make it easy for companies to reach out to unhappy customers, but it can also help identify targets for scammers. One traveler says she was targeted by a phony Air Canada agent responding to her online complaint, and now she wants to warn others. Here now's Peter Cowan has that story. Joanne Galarno tweeted out her frustration about an Air Canada delay earlier this month, and someone was listening. She got dozens of replies from supposed Air Canada agents offering to help, but there were red flags. I was social media aware enough to look at their profiles and realize that even though they had the Air Canada logo, they had, you know, saying that they were supervisors, that um, they didn't have any followers. So that triggered some alarm bells for me. 
She's not alone. When Air Canada customers share their travel troubles on X, the site formerly known as Twitter, not only does the legitimate Air Canada account reply, so do others. Fake replies from people claiming to be representatives, managers, and even the CEO, all offering to help, all asking you to share your booking reference and other information. But if you look at the profile claiming to be that CEO, you'll notice just a single follower. Most travelers may ignore it, but Galarno followed through, curious to see what would happen. When she provided her booking reference and name, they were able to find her phone number and message her on WhatsApp. They said she was entitled to $1,500 in compensation, but had to install an international money transfer app and make a request in Kenyan dollars. That's when she cut off all communications and blocked them, but she worries about other travelers who may be more desperate and less savvy. When you have flight cancellations and you have these stressful situations, individuals are just willing to, you know, have anyone help them that they can. The Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre says it doesn't have reports on people losing money to this particular fraud, but it follows a growing trend. Social media is how three quarters of scammers are connecting with victims. So generally, fraudsters are, will be targeting people that are putting themselves in a vulnerable situation. So in this case here, they're, they're looking for help with, uh, with an issue uh, with their airline ticket. So automatically, fraudsters are going to try to capitalize on that situation. Air Canada says it's deeply concerned about these fake accounts and it's scouring the internet, reporting them when it finds them. It says it will only reach out to customers using its official account. So, for example, on X, look for the gold check mark before you message them. Peter Cowan, CBC News, St. John's. Well, lawyers for the Innu Nation were in an Ottawa courtroom today challenging an agreement between the federal government and Southern Labrador's Nunatuavut Community Council. The Innu and other Indigenous groups across Canada are asking to throw out a 2019 Memorandum of Understanding signed by Canada and Nunatuavut. Here now's Mark Quinn explains. Labrador's Innu Nation is asking a federal court to quash Nunatuavut's MOU with Canada. They say the 2019 agreement suggests that what they say are false claims by the Nunatuavut Community Council are true. They are not Indigenous group that can hold rights. They are descendants of settlers who try to reinvent themselves to access resources, services, meant for legitimate Indigenous people. Members of the Northern Labrador Inuit Nation, Nunatsiavut, were also in Ottawa to support the Innu Nation's court challenge. They fear the MOU will lead to a loss of territory that rightfully belongs to Inuit and Innu groups. These false claims not only challenge our territorial integrity, but also erode the trust built over years of dialogue and collaboration. The government of Canada must recognize that further discussions with the Inuitu Harbour Community Council would legitimize baseless assertions. L'Assemblée des Premières Nations. They were also joined by an Inu leader from Quebec, an Inu representative from the Assembly of First Nations, who called on the federal government to respect their collective voices. When all Inuit and, uh, and First Nations peoples tell the government a group isn't legitimate, government should listen. The Nunatuavut Community Council was also in Ottawa for today's court proceedings. Members of the community, seen here at the Residential School Apology in Cartwright last fall, strongly reject claims that they are not Inuit. This sort of conversation that is now happening around, you know, uh, uh, Indigenous identity and false claims to Indigenous identity. That is an important conversation, but it, it is really not related to, to our situation whatsoever. It is only that some others are starting to try to project that conversation over on us. And, and really, there's no basis for it. The Indonesian's court challenge is scheduled to continue in Ottawa tomorrow. Todd Russell says the NCC will appeal if the Indigenous leaders who spoke out today get the decision they want. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. 
Well, a mental health advocate from this province is worried about the shutdown of a national support portal. Wellness Together Canada is closing its virtual doors at the beginning of next month. It offered resources, a 24-7 support line and counseling. As here now as Henrika Wilhelm reports, this has advocates across the country calling on provinces to step up. It was terrifying. I felt like I lost a lifeline. The news came as a shock for mental health advocate Christy Allen. Wellness Together Canada will shut down on April 3rd. The portal was her go-to recommendation for anyone needing support. One hour of counselling plus follow-ups, 24-7 accessibility, benefits she says a crisis line or provincial programs don't have. When you call someone and when you're in distress, you have to explain your story. And for a lot of people, that's super complex. It's very hard. And if you have people who are following up with you, then you don't have to repeat that. Allen is one of 4.2 million people from across the country who visited the site since its launch in April 2020. Paid for by the federal government, it was meant to support those with declining mental health due to the COVID-19 pandemic. It offered information and mental health and substance use services. But in a February statement, Health Canada said, while many Canadians continue to face challenges, we have seen some improvements in the mental health and well-being of Canadians since the lows of the COVID-19 pandemic. If you look at people's mental health prior to the pandemic, there has been no recovery. In fact, people's mental health and substance use health has gotten worse. National organizations are also alarmed the site is closing, stressing its benefits beyond COVID-19. This is a sector that has been chronically underfunded and, uh, and it's created a, a system of care that's very fractured and very difficult to navigate. And this one portal provided um, this low barrier access to care. Health Canada hasn't responded to a CBC News request for comment before airtime, but in its February statement said provinces and territories should fill any gaps left by Wellness Together's closure. Provincial Health Minister Tom Osborne says programs here, like Bridge the Gap, already do that. The programs we have in the province are very comprehensive and in fact more comprehensive than the programs that were offered under the federal program. Um, the vast majority of callers to programs use the provincial program because it is more comprehensive. While he says expanding services to 24-7 access is an option, he doubts there is demand for it. We do understand that uh, after hours under the federal program there were uh, a limited number of after-hour calls, uh, after hour, uh, beyond the hours of, of uh, programming that uh, Bridge the Gap has offered. It's a notion Alan strongly disagrees um, with. I'm a person with lived experience. How dare you say what I need, that you know what I need better than me. And I bet you there are so many people who would say the same thing. That is shocking and it is unacceptable. Ellen wants the province to expand its services to round the clock coverage and she wants Fury to create a standalone Department of Mental Health. She'll be closely watching tomorrow's budget to see how much money the province allocates for mental health care. Henrike Wilhelm, CBC News, St. John's. Well, the newest member of St. John's City Council was officially sworn in a few hours ago. Thank you, Chief Judge Fowler, and congratulations again, Councillor Davis. Mayor Danny Breen welcomed Tom Davis to council chambers during today's weekly meeting. Davis recently won the by-election for Ward 4, a seat that was left vacant after the departure of former Councillor Ian Froud. Davis won handily by more than 500 votes last week. Well, a spring officially on the way tonight. Is it going to feel like spring tomorrow? We'll talk all about it coming up.
This weather update is brought to you by the Healthcare Foundation Home Lottery. The bonus prize deadline is midnight, Friday, April 12th. Order tickets now at hcfhomelottery.ca. Well, Ashley, we are in the final hours of winter, and I am ready to say bye-bye, winter. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. <laughs> yes, uh, yes, officially we are for sure, but uh, as we know, spring uh, definitely doesn't arrive for a little while here in Newfoundland, Labrador. Uh, but we'll take it. Temperatures uh, today, pretty nice out there. Anywhere from 3 to 6 degrees is our daytime highs. This is a little bit above, well, either near or a little bit above where we should be sitting for this time of year. Temperatures across Labrador uh, are a bit warmer for sure. Three degrees in Happy Valley Goose Bay as well as you head towards the coast. So those temperatures a tad cooler hovering around the zero degree mark in Cartwright today. Taking a look at the wind, not overly impressive today, uh, which is nice. Top winds gusting anywhere from 30 to about 40 kilometers per hour, a little higher in Bonavista. But for the most part, we are uh, going to see the relatively light winds for the next little bit. But as we head into our uh, Wednesday morning into tomorrow morning, we are going to see a little gusty winds for the northern peninsula, eastern areas of the island as well, likely between 30 to 50 kilometers per hour. Then as our next system arrives, this is when we are going to see the uh, potential for some pretty brisk winds. And that will arrive Thursday and uh, we could be talking about 60 to 80 kilometers per hour for eastern areas of the island. We could see winds a bit higher than that. And with this area of low pressure, we'll likely see some snow to start and then train, change over to rain as we see some milder air. So this area of low pressure, unfortunately, is going to stick around with us for a little bit. So we will see through Thursday evening, even into Friday, uh, some areas seeing some fairly gusty winds. Same thing for coastal areas of Labrador by Friday morning. And eventually, as that area of low pressure starts to pull away on Saturday, we will see those winds ease right along with it. Now, as far as what's happening right now, we've got a couple of areas of low pressure, one to the west and one to the east, and that is just sparking a few showers or maybe even some flurries for eastern areas of the island, but certainly seeing some uh, flurry activity for the west. You can see that counterclockwise spin around that area of low pressure there. And that uh, is generally going to continue as we head through tonight. So most seeing light snow, uh, but you could see some heavier flurries at times uh, tonight. Uh, but for the most part, this is basically what you see is what you get uh, through the overnight as this unsettled area of low pressure sticks around. Northern Peninsula, southeastern Labrador, you're going to see some flurry activity as well as we get into tomorrow morning. Temperatures tonight are going to sit into the minus single digits, relatively light winds on the west coast, closer to that area of low pressure. As you head a little bit further east, we're looking at southwesterlies around 20 to 40 kilometers per hour. Really not a whole lot of wind up across Labrador either, but they'll be anywhere from about 10 to 20 kilometers per hour. As we head into tomorrow, the first half of the day actually looking pretty decent for the eastern portion of the island anyway. We should see some sunshine, uh, peaks of sun in the mix. Otherwise, the chance of flurries will stick around along the north coast, uh, the northeast coast, I should say, and uh, potentially some breaks in the cloud cover. And then as far as Labrador is concerned, just the chances some flurries will linger through a good chunk of the afternoon. But then we watch uh, some heavier uh, flurries move in for Lab West as the day goes on for your Thursday. And uh, that'll be as our next weather system arrives. So temperatures tomorrow, we've got uh, a southerly flow. So areas along the southern portion of the island will see temperatures a tad cooler, a little warmer as you're away from that onshore flow. So two, three degrees through tomorrow. Same thing through central. Harbor Breton, you'll hover around plus one. And as you head towards the west coast, light winds, some sunshine and some flurries in the mix, but your temperatures will be hovering anywhere from two to five degrees through the day. Same thing for southeastern Labrador and the northern peninsula with northwesterly winds, 20 to 40 kilometers per hour. And then as we head across uh, the big land, we're looking at about plus three in Happy Valley Goose Bay, but minus six in uh, Nain. Now we are looking at temperatures dipping. We've got a cold pocket of air moving back in. We could see those temperatures dipping back into the minus 20s as we round out the week. I'll get into those details when I come back. Well, as we saw earlier, public sector employees rallied today, hoping to send a message to government ahead of tomorrow's budget. NAEP members don't want the Trans-Canada Highway to be serviced by private companies. The CBC's Daryl Roberts dropped by today's protest. 
Hi, I'm April. I'm with NAEP. I work at Eastern Health. What was your reaction when you heard about the government's plan to use the public-private partnership model for highways? It's a horrible way to even think about it. Um, union is the way to go, like I said, for the wages. We fought very hard for the wages we have, for the supports, for the benefits. Privatization just brings us back many years to lower wages and no benefits. There are the people that you see out there when the snowstorm's on, uh, risking their own health and safety to try to keep our highways open. These individuals, they provide public services that this minister and previous ministers are contemplating replacing. Uh, and for their union, for these members, that's just not on. It's an advance of the budget. It's to send a message to the Fury team, Minister of Finance, Minister of TI. We will continue to escalate these actions that we see signaling in that budget that they're going to continue on. Because right now they're saying they're thinking about this. We've known that for months, actually, they've been contemplating this to back rooms. Minister Abbott told us that now a couple of weeks ago. So our message is that is not on for these workers. So important to deliver that message today just before budget. It's a 28,000 kilometer trail, but I, my goal was to do one continuous line, right? So, I mean, I went from the Atlantic coast all the way across Canada till Northern Alberta. An award-winning filmmaker spent years documenting herself as she hiked, biked, paddled, and snowshoed across the country. It's an incredible journey that began right here in St. John's. Her story is just ahead on Here and Now.
Well, hiking is certainly a popular pastime in this province, but just imagine hiking, biking, paddling, and snowshoeing across the entire country. One documentary filmmaker did just that. Diane Whalen spent years hiking the full length of the Trans-Canada Trail. She filmed the epic journey and turned it into a doc called 500 Days in the Wild. Whalen is from British Columbia, but her roots are right here in Newfoundland and Labrador, and that's where her trek began. She came to the here in our studio to talk about the experience. Public inquiry into the depths of Aboriginal women Over was resisting, but the provinces are looking to turn on this pressure. For a the world inquiry. had stopped making sense. And I was feeling lost too, you know. And full of anger, it's a 28,000 kilometer trail, but I, my goal was to do one continuous line, right? So, I mean, I went from the Atlantic coast all the way across Canada till northern Alberta. And then it was a 4,000 kilometer paddle up to the Arctic Ocean and then along the ocean to Tuktoyaktuk and then back down south into northern Alberta, made my way um, through Alberta into BC, through the Rockies. Um, once I hit Vancouver, it was just under a 300 kilometer paddle to Victoria and that was mile zero. There are 24,000 kilometers. Of it's trails, far. We have a big country. Well, wow, this is a love letter to Canada. Like. Wait till you see the cinematography of this beautiful place that we live. Wait till you see the beautiful people. And you know what's amazing? Is it doesn't matter if you're liberal, NDP, conservative. It's irrelevant out there. Nobody asks that on a trail. All that matters is that you have the shared love of wherever you're at right now. This took it to a whole new challenge. But yeah, so I mean, that's conceptually, professionally, it made total sense. And on a personal level, my life was going through some changes, you know. I just turned 50 and uh, my marriage had ended and my dog had died and I just found myself at a place where the life that I had lived was over. And, uh, you know, I was using this expression, it's time to check out to check in, you know, like peel back the layers and really get to uh, know myself. And if I was going to build whatever I would build on the future would be based on that kind of really healthy foundation of self-understanding and growth, you know. What's your connection to Newfoundland and Labrador? Oh, it's immense, <laughs> and I'm so glad you asked that question. My connection to Newfoundland is, well, my family's been here for a few centuries. I'm a Whalen, so it was a Whalen who married a Whelan, but we say it Whalen. You know, um, my grandmother, Mary Whalen, was from King's Cove up in Air Bonavista, and she left home at 14 and came here and worked as a nanny and met her husband, Ed Whalen. Um, he was delivering groceries with a little horse and cart. And they got married and had 11 kids. And he died of tuberculosis when she was pregnant with her 11th child. So I come from a strong woman. Because that woman could, like, they wanted to take some of her kids away. All my aunts and uncles as I grew up had those terrifying stories of being in the kitchen when the people would come in and say, we're going to take some of your kids. And she never let them. So, and then our poster, it's Signal Hill. And that's a really symbolic, you know, um, beacon of communication, which I hope on some level this love letter to Canada can be. Because it's all about not what makes us different, it's about what makes us the same. And what we share, you know, not, um, and what we share is this land, you know, and these waters. So, yeah, it's a great honor for me. And I started from here in Newfoundland, partly because I wanted to follow the sun home, you know back to the West Coast, but also to honor my ancestors. Because, you know, one of the things I've learned is um, I am a descendant of them, but I'm also tomorrow's ancestor. And maybe that's like a responsibility that we also all share. 10 days into the trip, you know, like I need duct tape, the windows are coming out of my tent, you know, uh, the bottoms of my shoes are coming off. I mean, I'm failing camping school, coming out of the gate here in Newfoundland, but I had people around to help me. And you know, another reason why I wanted to start here was I always say the heart of the rock, the softer the heart. Because I knew, just from being raised and the way I was raised, that if I ever needed help in Newfoundland, I could go knock on any door. And I, wouldn't, I would not have been afraid in a way that I could not have done that anywhere else in Canada. So it was, it was good to start here. This is really intense, man. There are so many kind people out there. And I needed to be broken down. I needed to be broken open. You know, I lost five tents here in Newfoundland. 
The last one, I was in St. Fenton, Newfoundland. I was just devastated. It was all through my own, like, failing camping school kind of mistakes, right? Well, St. Fenton is just one little, ta one little store in that town. And I walked into the store, and everybody hopped onto their ATVs, went looking for Dee's tent. Oh, so sorry, can't find your tent. And I'm like, oh, I got a couple days to, you know, Puerto Basco. I'm going to get eaten alive. And then this 1970s pickup truck pulls up. And out comes this man with a beard. And he walks over, and he's got one of those tents that's like an eight-man tent in a box like this. And I'm thinking, oh, my god, I don't know if I can carry this box. Anyway, and, and then as he approaches me, I see that he's crying. So I take this box and I say thank you and I start to kind of well up and he just gets in his car and drives away and I turn around and all the women in the store are crying. I've got this tent and it turns out his daughter who was graduated had just been killed in a car accident and this was hers and he heard I needed a tent. How did that make you feel? It just cracks you open. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, so much of it's about letting go of fear, right? There's lots of fear. So right out of the, the first challenge was just being a woman alone in a tent at night. There, you can't lock a tent. So, you know, that was a fear I had to confront, and the only way to confront it is to do it. And then night after night after night went by, months led to years, and, you know, there's a difference between loneliness and solitude, right? And, like, humans are just 0.001% of all life on Earth. So when you go out there and you spend that kind of time alone in nature, you really do start feeling connected to that web of life again. I think it's just hidden in all of our DNA, you know, because really nature's going home. Um, and after a while, you start feeling more connected to that other 99.9% .9 of life out there than you've ever felt connected to anything in your whole life. And what you come back with is a real sense of connection to yourself and, and the real you. As they say, it's the journey, not the destination.
marking 75 years of Confederation this month. It was in the final hours of March 31st, 1949, that Newfoundland joined Canada with a final vote of 52 to 48 percent in favor. In February of 1974, legislation was introduced to bring down the Union Jack. But as you're about to see in this archival report, not everyone could agree on a proper replacement. Symbol of a once mighty empire, the Union Jack is soon to disappear from Britain's oldest North American colony and Canada's newest province. Its death, even before the fact, surprisingly is being mourned by only a few, while the lineup of would-be flag designers grows longer. The Irish Catholics here feel left out. They asked for the inclusion of a harp on the new flag, or at least a bit of green. Neither request has been met so far. We've had a, a, a correspondence from the Knights of Columbus suggesting that. Uh, we've had correspondence from others suggesting the background should be blue, uh, various shades thereof, uh, red, uh, you name it, we've had the suggestions. Uh, we, we sat down and, and um, tried to figure out what we wanted on the flag uh, as, a, as basic units, and we decided that the Union Jack should remain on it up in the upper left corner. And uh, we had many, many suggestions as to what to put into the fly or the main part of the flag, ranging from a caribou head to a moose head to the pitcher plant to a Newfoundland dog to a seal. And, you know, there was just uh, uh, no way you could pick either one over the other. These designs have come from all parts of the province without government solicitation. The suggestions containing the Union Jack come mainly from an older age group. Designs from children almost always fail to make the British connection. For Newfoundland, whatever the final choice, it will be the third and some argue the fourth flag since the 17th century. The others, surprisingly, are still flying in St. John's. Jim Bugden, a security guard at the government building, daily has to raise and lower the Union Jack. But in his backyard, it's a different story. The red ensign with the badge of Newfoundland, dating back to 1632, will always top his flagpole. Still other groups cling to the pink, white and green, the 150-year-old flag of the Native Peoples Association, English, Scottish and Irish. For them, any debate over a new flag is academic. They already have theirs. Bill Mitchell, CBC News, St. John's. Well, it would be another six years before renowned artist Christopher Pratt's creation would be adopted. The province's official flag incorporates the Union Jack of old, as well as uh, influence from ancient Beothic and Innu designs. Officials with the UN Food Agency say that famine is imminent in parts of Gaza, so the supplies rolling in are crucial. Medical attention is also in short supply, and some patients need to be airlifted out for treatment in neighboring countries. Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault takes us on one of those evacuation flights. What you're looking at here is the way out for some severely wounded Palestinians. We're in the belly of a C-17, it's a Qatari plane, it's just landed here in Egypt, not far from Rafa, not far from the border with Gaza. And they are transporting as many people as they can, people who need some advanced surgeries, people who've been wounded in this war. The Emir of Qatar has said that he wanted to treat as many as 1,500 Palestinians and to bring their families over, there'll be a place for them to stay, so that's what this is about. We've had a chance to talk to a few people so far. There are a lot of kids here. Uh, there are a lot of people who, who seem completely exhausted and also completely terrified. And all the medical staff have been warned that this experience of this plane, it can be noisy, it, it, can, it can move around a lot, the turbulence can be real, that this can also re-traumatize them given everything they've been through. So all eyes here will be on each one of these patients to make sure they have everything they need until they get to Qatar. What they cannot offer them is any assurance that they will ever be able to go back to Gaza. Well, CBC News Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault will have more on that story tonight on The National.
Supporting the commercial seal hunt, are there new opportunities to find global allies? Watch part two of an appeal for seal, Sunday at 11.30 and Monday at 7.00. Time for a look at the long range, and of course, it's going to be spring on the calendar, but is the forecast going to cooperate with that? Well, uh, maybe not spring sunshine, but mm -hmm. we're certainly going to see uh, some spring rain uh, for some of us as we head through Thursday. This is also when we're going to see the winds pick up a little bit. So let's, pay, let's look at what's going to happen uh, as we head through our Wednesday evening and into Thursday morning. This is when our next system will arrive. So. Uh, it does look like some of us will see snow to start. It will transition very quickly through to uh, some rain. And that will be the story, at least for the southern half of the island, as we get into Thursday evening. Then some of that snow will head a little bit further north towards the northern peninsula, higher elevations on the west coast and eventually southeastern portions of Labrador as well. Uh, but yes, temperatures are going to climb two to five degrees. We're going to return to that southerly flow, which is going to change that over to some rain through the day. Now, Labrador, eventually, as you get into the evening and overnight, you are going to see that transition uh, or you're going to see snow. Uh, but uh, the first part of your day is actually going to be above zero. So anywhere from one to about three or four degrees through the afternoon. So there's our Thursday evening and into Friday. So there's where that snow will push right across Labrador. Some of this will be heavy at times. We could be talking about amounts over 20 centimeters in some cases for Labrador. Uh, but we get back into that southerly flow onshore flurries potentially for the west coast of the island by Friday morning. Otherwise, we should see some clearing skies through the day. Southern areas of the island may see uh, some of that snow stick around as well. Uh, but for the most part, our temperatures are going to be hovering around the zero degree mark, maybe a degree above on the south coast. Otherwise, between one and about three degrees through the day. And again, generally a clearing trend, but the winds are going to stay up. That will be the story right through Saturday as well. Our temperatures across Labrador will sit anywhere from zero to plus one, a little cooler towards the west and the north. But in behind this area of low pressure is when we will really see that drop across Labrador. Daytime highs for St. John's and, e Saint John's and Eastern Newfoundland will stay above zero through the daytime, but our night times will drop down below zero. Friday, Saturday looking pretty decent at this point. Sunday return of either some showers or flurries through the day. And then for central Newfoundland, you're looking at uh, temperatures up above zero, but still the chance of some flurries in the mix there. For western Newfoundland, same thing, but hovering a little closer to zero for here Saturday. And then for Labrador, you're looking at your temperatures uh, back down below zero by Sunday. But there's your overnight lows dipping and really dipping for western Labrador into the minus 20s uh, for your Saturday, Sunday. But Sunday... Sunshine. That will be the story. And speaking of some sunshine, red sky at morning <laughs> over Mad Rock there. Uh, Carol shared this lovely, brilliant uh, shot with us. Thank you so much for that. And if you have any weather photos, you can send them to my Facebook page, but the best place to uh, email them is nlphotos at cbc.ca. That is gorgeous. Lovely color saturation there. It's so <laughs> vibrant with the orange and the yellow. Light winds, beautiful ocean. Love it. Great Thank shot. you so much, Carol, for that. Really appreciate it. All right, so that's it for us. Tomorrow is budget day, so that's going to be an yeah. interesting, busy day. We'll have lots of coverage of that, so be sure to tune in for our budget day coverage tomorrow. That's right. And, uh, yeah, that's it for us. Thank you so much for spending part of your evening with us. Good night.